Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Senate Majority Leader talks about Republican priorities and the State Budget Commissioner bids farewell. Plus, Senate committees take aim at some agency leaders and a medical expert testifies about challenges facing schools during the pandemic. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. In the coming November election, all 67 state Senate seats will be on the ballot. Currently, the Senate Republicans hold the majority with 35 seats. A few weeks ago, I spoke with Senate Minority Leader Susan Kent. This week, I spoke with Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka about the priorities of his caucus. The most pressing concern for lawmakers before priorities and policies is the projected budget deficit facing the state. The latest numbers from Minnesota Management and Budget show that expenditures are expected to exceed revenues by $4.7 billion in the next biennium. How does this information shape caucus priorities? Well, it's actually alarming because uh, you have to add to that the shortfall that we have right now, and it's actually over $6 billion when you, when you do it that way. And so it, it should remind everyone, so the legislative branch and the executive branch, that you have to tighten your belt. I mean, I, I was through one of these in 2011, and it was extremely difficult. And so, you know, we'll be looking at, frankly, how, do we, how are we more efficient with what we do in government? Tax cuts are often a priority for your caucus. Are tax cuts off the table because of the projected budget deficit? Well, I think tax cuts stimulate an economy, but you know, one thing, frankly, we've been looking at right now is something called Section 179. It helps the ag community and small businesses to deduct expenses up front. That's the kind of thing that we should still be looking at so that they, you know, they, they invest more, which means they create more jobs and more opportunities. So they're not off the table, no. Okay. Um, your caucus in the last few years tackled housing affordability, looking for ways to roll back unnecessary regulations and to improve home ownership. Because of the pandemic and related job losses, one could argue that affordable housing is more important than ever before. Are there ways, despite the budget shortfall, to increase housing affordability? You know, the simplest thing is, is not to overregulate, and that's all housing. That's the small house and the big house. You know, I've been to other states and I can't, I can't believe how inexpensive a home is there versus Minnesota. And so we have to look at what are the things that we regulate. I know compared to Wisconsin, our cost to build is dramatically higher. And so this is the time that we should now be looking at that. You know, and we also have been doing housing bonds to help create more affordable housing. But the biggest thing I think we could do long term is, is to correct the overregulation. Addressing the high cost of health care and prescription drugs has also been a priority for your caucus. Uh, does it remain so? And in what areas might there be further improvement? Yeah, this is one that I think will be around for a long time. You know, reinsurance was something that we did that allowed, allowed us to stabilize the health insurance market in Minnesota. We now have the lowest cost for health insurance premium around the country. Uh, think about what we did for insulin, that we provided emergency fly, supplies for that. Uh, we reformed the benefit manager, that's the middleman on prescriptions, to, to be more accountable. Uh, its work is never done on this, uh, but what we won't do is we won't go to uh, one care, is what the governor calls it, for, for Medicare for all, or some form of completely government-run health care. We don't think that's the direction, but... We have to bring more competition uh, and more innovation because this is a, a major expense for most families. And how has COVID-19 shaped your views on healthcare? And, and has it? Has it at all? Yeah, one silver lining is we do way more telemedicine. We do more, way more Zoom calls. Uh, and that has, is, will help drive down the cost of insurance, uh, but it will also make medical care more accessible everywhere. And so we're all figuring that out, but with the, the technology and the cameras that, that film so accurately now, we really can do a lot with telemedicine and we, we uh, made it easier because of COVID. That was a, a national drive, but it really has helped in Minnesota. 
Um, as you know, child care providers were already struggling, um, particularly in rural areas before COVID-19. Since COVID-19, uh, I imagine it's, it's even more challenging. Can the legislature do more to assist child care providers, especially in those rural areas where services have been difficult to attain? Yes, and a lot of that has to do with making it very difficult for the small mom pod uh, daycare provider. Uh, we've put on so many regulations. Again, regulations in Minnesota have crippled their ability to function. So many people just said, it's not worth it. I don't want to do it. So that's a big area that we can help. We did uh, listening groups all across the state, and that was probably the number one issue they talked about is you make it so difficult for us to be able to watch our neighbor's kids while they're working or doing whatever else they're doing. So that's probably number one. We do need to crack down and we did on, on the fraud. You heard the child care assistance program where there was a abuse of that. We, we made good progress there, but you know, those two things uh, are, are things that we've done and I think we'll continue to work on this area because it's a very, very important need for many families. This fall, under guidelines set by the Minnesota Health Department, school districts will open in a variety of ways depending on you know, the level of infection with the coronavirus. There's in-person, there's a hybrid approach, and then there's also distance-only learning. Potentially this fall, more and more schools may have to go to the distance-only model due to the coronavirus. Education spending is already a significant portion of the state budget. Will schools have the support, both financially and in terms of infrastructure, that they need in order to educate kids as we continue in this uncertain time? Well, first of all, I think it's a big mistake that we are setting up a system that many high schools in particular aren't gonna be able to have their kids in, in school. Uh, school is essential for our kids. And I think it's like one person under age 20 has died from COVID in Minnesota. It's not a problem for our kids, and, but, but not getting a good education is a major problem for our kids. And so I'm gonna continue to push to get all kids back in school, but with the, the, uh, the metrics that they have put out there, it's almost impossible for many schools to have a high school. And so, and I think COVID cases will rise in the fall. That's sort of what happens with other viruses. And if that happens and all the schools are shut down again, our kids will fall behind. So that's number one is we gotta get kids back in school. There's no other option that I see as acceptable. And then as far as resources and, and, and how we fund that, we have put in large amounts of, of dollars for education over the last number of years. Uh, when we, we're going to have an ec economic downturn, we're all going to have to figure out how to live with the resources that we have, and that will be tough. This next year will be very, very difficult. If we're $6 billion short or $8 billion or whatever the number, it will be a very challenging year. Um, the legislature recently passed a police reform bill to improve accountability in policing and hopefully to prevent another death like that of George Floyd. Are there other areas in the criminal justice system that require reform? You know, we're, I, I said that we would keep an open mind and, and look at uh, any of the issues that we couldn't get to during this uh, uh, police accountability bill that we passed. And so we'll do hearings on some of those other issues. Uh, but I, I am proud of the bill that we actually did. Uh, all of the groups came together in the end and said, this is good, all of them. Uh, some said it was not enough, but but it was something that we were, were very proud of. Uh, and, and at the same time, we, we did not, uh, um, we, we felt like the police were doing a good job, but that we had to figure out a way to uh, pluck out a bad apple here or there. We needed to make sure that we had more citizen input. We really wanted them to have input, but we still wanted the police to run the, the police board, not somebody else. And so uh, it was very, very good, but it's, it's in fact amazing how much we got done in the special session. But you know, we're, we're not done there. We'll do the hearings and see if we have more to do. And finally, before we go, as you know, the Department of Corrections recently announced the closure of two small correctional facilities to help address a budget shortfall. Is this a good move? And is this the kind of budget trimming that may be necessary to have that balanced budget in the next biennium? So this, I think, was the first one that they actually did to reduce spending. It probably would have been the last one for us. We just feel like public safety is, is, is the most important of all the things that we can do. Uh, back in April, I said that the, the governor should be 
cutting each agency 5%. If you go back to 2011, when we had a shortfall, they all did that internally because they knew they had to do it. They didn't tell us where they were saving the money, they just did. Had we done that, we would save $100 million every month. And so think about from April to next year, that's a, you know, a billion dollars or more that we could have saved. Other states have been doing this. Other states have cut five to 10% off of every agency. Why we have not, uh, I don't have an answer for, but as we're moving into next year and we get the numbers, that's what we'll, we'll see where we're gonna be. The other big disappointment is, disappointment is man management and budget said that they were gonna do a forecast in August to take another snapshot about where we are. Are we, how bad is it? Well, they've decided not to do that now. And I don't know if that means it's really bad or you know, we'll see, but the next snapshot, if they don't change that position is in November and, and we'll see, but I, I, I do expect it to be difficult and that's why I, I wish the, the government, governor and his agencies would all reduce spending 5% now. Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka, it's always so nice to talk to you. Thank you for your time today. You bet. The Senate Education Committee recently invited Dr. Sarah Crane of the Mayo Clinic to highlight the latest challenges facing students, teachers, and parents as they prepare for the new school year. Children can get it, yes, they can transmit it. Younger children seem to be more resilient in the face of this disease than perhaps adolescents are. Any of our colleagues on the committee who work um, perhaps in the aging area with our skilled nursing facilities would be familiar with the fact that screening means you've checked once. Um, and so our protocols in those areas actually call for multiple monitoring. Is it a practical reality in our schools to maintain that type of a testing um, volume and frequency, we would love that to be the case someday. It is not the case today. The child's ability to reliably report that they have fever would also be a little bit of a challenge. I think here I respect any efforts that the schools are making to help with screening, emphasizing that if you are feeling unwell, you should not um, be coming to school. And I don't want to come across as saying that this is all, that the risk in the decisions that we make this fall are all about the virus. The risk to lock ourselves at home and not send any kids to school is just as serious and is a balancing um, act that all of us acknowledge. If we're talking about distance learning, we should be investing and in filling the gaps that are in those places. Um, if we're talking about face-to-face uh, -face learning, we need to make sure that we've made accommodation for those for whom that's not safe, either because of their own health issues or because of their families. And so that it's not going to be a clean one or the other model, and we have to accommodate that diversity across that spectrum. Myron Franz has led the state's accounting and budgeting agency for a decade. Next month, he's moving on to lead a similar charge at the University of Minnesota. I spoke with him this week about his legacy, his new job, and the state's fiscal future. Governor Walls has described the position of Commissioner of Management and Budget as the Chief Financial Officer, the Chief Accounting Officer, the Comptroller, the person who helps negotiate state contracts, the person who looks at state health care benefits and pensions, not to mention someone who works on fiscal policy with the legislature. You've held this position for 10 years. What are you most proud of? Well, that is such a great question because, you know, thinking about 10 years at this reflecting point for me, it, there, I've been thinking about all these different things that have occurred over the last, the last 10 years. You know, one of the things that's fundamental, frankly, was the tax reform that we did in 2013. Because the tax reform where we, in, we uh, increased the fourth income tax tier for the top 2% of wage earners, uh, that has been the foundation for virtually everything we've done since. Because as you remember, the decade before Governor Dayton took over, that's what we called the dec decade of deficits. And so we knew going into the 2011-2012 sessions, we needed to do something about the deficits. And we felt the only way to really do that effectively was to increase the revenues. 
And by making them more fair, we believe with the fourth income tax here, we started that process in 2013. And since 2013, we've had surplus after surplus after surplus. And that was the, the foundation for making sure that we could go forward because you can't invest in healthcare and education and childcare and in treatment centers and roads and bridges if you don't have a fundamental budget that supports those kind of investments. So I think actually, although I'm proud of a lot of the different things we've done, that's the one that stands out to me because it was so consequential for the remainder of Governor Dayton's term and now the beginning of Governor Walz's term. So now that the state is facing an uncertain economic future due to the coronavirus pandemic, which may decimate the rainy day fund and still leave a huge budget hole, in retrospect, was the size of that fund large enough? Now, Minnesota was touted nationally for setting aside that rainy day fund, and at one time, it seemed huge. And now, considering the environment we are in, it doesn't seem so huge anymore. You know, yeah, when we're facing it, we're now the, the deficit we're projecting for this fiscal year is now down to 2.3 billion. So it's come down a little bit. And the uh, actual rainy day funds come up a little bit because there were some funds from the assigned risk pool that we added about $20 million. So we're a little over 2.377 billion now. You know, one of the discussions about the size of the budget reserve really, we tried to figure out what would it take to satisfy most recessions. So our goal was to have a, the reserve be big enough to satisfy what we thought 95% of the time would be the size of, an, of a recessionary effect. Well, we didn't plan for a pandemic and a global recession at the same time. So you know, you always, you, you, now we'll sharpen those pencils going forward. But the goal really was to get us through that first year or so. And because all the, all the surplus, or the, I'm sorry, all the reserve, what it does is to give you time. And so, but if you look at it right now, the, the reserve more than covers the, um, the uh, deficit right now. Now, we don't want to spend all the reserve this year because we know going forward we have future problems too. So we would like, we wish it was bigger right now, but I think in retrospect, uh, the idea of trying to pick a reserve level that would be politically acceptable, because you uh, point out, it seemed like a lot of money. And there were people throughout the last four or five years who wanted to give all that money back. And I think right now we're pretty happy we didn't give it back. And we have the $2.3 billion sitting in that rainy day reserve. I know that the, um, the rating agencies, that was part of their reason for restoring our AAA credit status, just looking at the rainy day fund and our budget surpluses. So we did the right thing, made the right steps. And of course, I wish there was more right now, but I think, we, I think we made the right decision to get it to where we got it to. When Governor Walls announced that you were leaving and who would replace you, he said, quote, there's about two people in the state that can do this job. And he was referring to you and Jim Showalter, who will take over. How tough is the road ahead for him? You know, Jim Showalter, is, I have to confess, he's a good friend of mine and a great colleague. He, helped because I took over from m and when he left after in Governor Dayton's term. And he was a great, great assist to me when, when I was a revenue uh, commissioner for the first four years and he was the m and commissioner, we spent a lot of time together because as I mentioned, part of the problem with the budget was we didn't have enough money. So money, of course, means tax revenue. So we spent a lot of time working and planning. So I know Jim to be someone of high character, really smart and uh, knows this job. But I think that the challenge for, for uh, for Jim going forward and for the state going forward is to do the same thing we've, we've done before. Remember, he was here when we had a $6.2 billion deficit. He was at the helm of MMB. And that was a point where we had to really make some tough budget situation, budget calls, some revenue calls. So I think the, the, the tough road ahead is trying to come to some agreement about what are the tools we're going to use to dig out of this? Because I told the rating agencies when we met with them in in July and August before our bond sale. I said the key for us is to make sure that we can convince uh, the rest of the country and people in Minnesota that we know what are the building blocks. It's really very simple. You watch your spending, you look for new revenue sources, you look for existing revenue or funds that can be transferred, and you try to make things work as best you can while trying to maintain the service level. So the road ahead, the challenge will be to maintain service level for those people who need it the most. And that's always a difficult time in an economic downtime, downturn. It's, it's even doubly true now with a, with a pandemic as well. So he's, he's got a tough road ahead of him, but he's the kind of guy 
and, and I think he's the right person at the right time. Finally, you are headed to the University of Minnesota. You will become the Senior Vice President of Finance and Operations. Even before the pandemic, higher education was facing significant fiscal challenges. Are you just jumping from the frying pan into the fire? How are you thinking about this change? Well, I think a little bit, perhaps. You know, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to is President Gable and the Board of Regents working together with the faculty and the students and the staff at the University of Minnesota. There's a lot that has to be done in order to make sure that they can deliver the kind of edu high quality education that the University of Minnesota has been come for. Both, it's one of the premier research facilities in the country, one of the best teaching facilities in the country and educational facilities. So there's a lot to be proud of. And the challenge is gonna be with, with uh, with, with the challenge to in-person education. How, do we, how does the university maintain that draw and the attraction to keep students coming there? So I think there's a lot to, uh, there's a lot to work on and I'm, I'm pretty assured that I'll be busy uh, when I go up over there to, to work with the U. I'm looking forward to it. They've been just great to, to work for. I look forward to uh, talking to the Board of Regents who have to approve my uh, appointment and I look forward to working with them in the next several weeks. Commissioner Myron Franz, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much. Controversial issues have prompted the Senate to consider the confirmations of some agency leaders, beginning with Commerce Commissioner Steve Kelly and the appeal of the Enbridge Line 3 oil pipeline construction project. The statute um, that the legislature adopted and a previous governor signed uh, directs our attention to a different issue. And the issue that the statute, that the laws of this state point us to, is the question whether um, the proponent of a pipeline has uh, produced a, a long range demand forecast and whether the Public Utilities Commission has evaluated that uh, forecast. Uh, the department's um, appeal is based on our uh, uh, view that um, Enbridge did not submit a long range demand forecast and that the Public Utilities Commission did not have an opportunity to evaluate such a forecast. The Public Utilities Commission reviewed in, in the light of not having a demand forecast document, uh, they very, very recently on a four to one vote, including two commissioners that Governor Walls has put forth and is on the PUC Commission, they, they ruled four to one to move forward with this. They do not, did not have the demand forecast and they are the objective non-biased regulatory authority that has jurisdiction over this. I did not create this requirement. The statute does uh, that says that the commission shall evaluate a long range demand forecast. Um, that is also in the commission's own rules. The Walls administration, which you are a commissioner of, continues to hold to the same old worn out answer of that it's in the statutes. Having served in the legislature, I am truly respectful of the role of the legislature in uh, establishing the laws in this state. And I am not going to lightly um, draw back from enforcing one of the laws um, that this <clears throat> legislature has passed uh, because of that respect. Why has the agency picked one side when you said you advocate for the public and this is an issue that is, you know, many people in the public are on both sides. And with this action, the agency has picked one side. Forces in society have lined things up regrettably um, so that this uh, comes across as a conflict between environmental advocates uh, and working people who are looking for jobs. The whole state is suffering from these executive orders and such that have shut down a lot of our businesses. But in rural Minnesota, it's even worse. A lot of small places um, will not survive. This would be a tremendous economic boost to our small communities. Thank you for having this hearing because it really shows what an amazing, uh, incredibly qualified commissioner he is. That being said, I have to say, I believe this has been a kangaroo hearing. Uh, you had a list of people you wanted to ask specific 
uh, curated questions and uh, you jumped right to them, uh, didn't give really any of us the opportunity and then you're, and you're cutting this hearing short. Um, so clearly uh, it sounds like decisions have already been made. This is an informational hearing only so there will not be a vote taken. I would assume if the vote would have been taken that it probably been to move it forward without recommendation. And Pollution Control Agency Commissioner Laura Bishop had to answer pointed questions about her agency's consideration of stricter car emission standards. The clean car standards are not something new or untested. Before April 2020, clean car standards on low emissions were the federal government's standards for every lawmaker working to meet low emissions for their new uh, vehicles. Despite the federal government's rollback, many automa automakers, including Ford and Honda, have committed to continuing to use those clean state car standards. Earlier this year, I came to these committees to discuss clean cars. As I said then, and have told many of you privately, no final decision on clean car standards has been determined. We've had the conversation many times and in our uh, personally in my office, we've had it in the committee about not having meetings around the state to inform Minnesotans about the uh, California emissions um, standard that you're going to implement. And those meetings still, we had our, our committee hearing what back January, February, those meetings have not held, have place. None of our folks know that you're still going, you know, full, full board down the, the railroad track with this uh, implementation. And so um, it's troubling to me that, that you haven't had those meetings. California standards, by the way, uh, is something that we would have to follow if this was if this was uh, accepted. And, and I might remind you and, and the members that uh, California has 24 million cars and Minnesota has four, four million. There's quite a difference there. Uh, and, and California does not deal with 30, 40 below weather. So um, I'm just wondering if, if the governor has considered considered allowing the 201 legislators who represent all of Minnesota to, to uh, weigh in on this. Almost half the cars sold in Minnesota now meet that state standard. So this isn't a um, issue about uh, the standard as much as what you have said is, do people know about this? I am getting letters every day asking me to move forward on this. Does that gauge where we are? Uh, no, because of course you are likely getting letters that say don't move forward on this. I think the important part of this is that uh, in 20, 2007, the legislature also put in statute a goal through the Next Generation Energy Act to reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. That is, uh, we are not on track. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. Thank you.